Thank you very much for the invitation, Patricia, to come here. Um, she, Patricia gave me a really hard task. She said, um, I want you to talk about indoor vertical farming, and, and it's very close to World Soils Day, so I want you to mention soil erosion. And I said, you realise there's no soil in an indoor vertical farm. <laughs> and uh, it's partly how I came up with the title, actually. But, um, but actually, World Soil Day, I do hope you do celebrate World Soil Day. Soil is incredibly important. I hope you'll get that message from my talk today. And uh, take a moment on the 5th to actually tweet or to blog or, or just think about soil on that day because it is what we all depend on um, and uh, I hope you'll, you'll get that message from my talk. So am I okay here? So the title is what if soil was too valuable to grow food which sounds like a ridiculous thing to say but it is meant to be an introduction to discussion about the rise of in vertical indoor farming which doesn't use soil. Um, what I'm going to do is talk about um, in terms of the content of my lecture, I want to talk about the global and the local challenge, particularly around climate change and biodiversity crises that we face. I will talk about soil degradation and erosion as well, um, but really as an, as an excuse to digress to talk about James Hutton, the scientist, who you've all heard of, of course. Yeah, yeah okay, yeah. good. But I want to make a link to soil, soil and James Hutton. Um, and then I'm going to use that to sort of talk about what, what is indoor vertical farming and why do we actually maybe need this in, in the future and talk about the benefits and opportunities that it potentially presents to us. And so I always start off with this picture of the globe from outer space and um, the reason I do this is because it helps to describe the fact that this is a closed system. So apart from the odd astronaut, meteor, nothing comes in and nothing goes out. So everything we depend on on the planet is on the planet. The one thing we do get for free is radiation and we get lots of different types of radiation and we can use that radiation which is energy to transform the matter that's on our planet um, but that's the only thing we get for free so everything we need is on the planet and it has to be recycled or used very very carefully now there's a problem with that and that is our population is growing um, estimated to be 8.3 billion by 2030 over 9 billion by 2050 and a lot of people will present that and say that's causing an increase in food demand by 50%, uh, an increase in energy by 50%, freshwater demand by 30%, and we need another 120 million hectares of land in developing countries just to grow crops. And at the same time, the soil is eroding and the biodiversity being lost. It's a pretty desperate situation. And on top of that, the climate is changing and it's probably going to make all these things worse. The reality is that the population is not going up by 50%. So why is the demand going up by 50%? And it's not the population, it's the consumption. And it's the consumption that is the real problem. We all want to consume an awful lot more than we really need. And that's not meant to be a Sunday sermon or anything like that. It's what the facts that you've presented here actually tell us. And on top of that, the other fact that goes with this uh, slide really is that there are now more obese and overweight people in the world than there are starving people. And that actually tells you we grow enough food to feed this population, but it's the distribution of that food and the governance systems and the, the variation across the world around food production that actually is uh, causing that to actually happen. And this is a, a, a photograph of what different families around the world would buy or grow or gather in a week to feed them in a, in a week. And you can see the different, uh, you can probably guess where they're from in different parts of the world by the, the faces. Um, Huge variation in the quantities of food that they actually have available to them in a week. Huge variation in, the, in the, the differences between raw and processed foods. Some people actually have to buy their water, others don't. Uh, and it really shows you this huge diversity and change in the quality and um, availability of food around the world. And, it, you know, we can grow enough food, but we need to find ways of actually sharing that food properly uh, around the world. As I said, the soil is degrading, and soils really are a fundamental part of each and every nation's natural capital. Um, in developing countries in particular, the World uh, Bank have estimated up to 70% of the value of the natural capital in developing countries is actually their soil. And that's because they're a primary producing country. All of the produce they, they have is coming from the soil. Uh, and soils obviously are very slow to form, but their functions and, the, and they themselves can be lost quickly due to extreme events and proper management. Um, or contamination. And the photograph that you can see there is from Kenya. Um, I arrived three years after that happened. So that from start to finish that happened in three years. And the tree at the bottom of that gully didn't grow there, it fell in there. 
and at the very top I can you can possibly see a little black dot that's actually a goat and a lot of these issues are actually caused by overgrazing in these regions so soil degradation is a major global problem threatening the sustainability of our terrestrial ecosystem services and we do need to value it uh, very much but what about Scotland dramatic things like that don't happen in Scotland well this is a picture from near Monny Musk and this is the second time in the same place that this soil erosion event happened due to intense rain and it's no accident those lines that you can see coming down from the, the slope are actually the tram lines of the tractor so instead of going across the slope the tractor has been going up and down the slope it's created compaction in weak areas heavy rains have come and we've suddenly got a big soil erosion event so it does happen in Scotland and it potentially will happen a lot more with more intense rainfall in, in the future and this is where I'm going to digress to talk about James Hutton and the link to soil erosion because the Institute is named after James Hutton who was a leading figure of the Scottish Enlightenment uh, and in my view he's probably one of the top two scientists that Scotland have ever produced does anybody want to make a guess about who the other one is so if you ask the Royal Society of Edinburgh they'll give you James Clark Maxwell mathematician um, and astronomer and James Hutton uh, fundamentally changed the way we think about the world and he was one of these polymaths who investigated chemistry, mineralogy, geology. He's known as the father of geology, in fact, and the discoverer of what we call deep time, and that is the age of the planet. Very importantly, he was a farmer. In fact, the, the brown outfit that he's gone was the farmer's uniform of the time. And the manuscript that you see in the table is the elements of agriculture, and which he described as the study of his life. But he is most well known for his theory of the earth. And in fact, he was one of the first to think of the earth as a living system. Uh, which changed and evolved over time. And soil erosion, of course, occurs all the time, even on moderate slopes. And James Hutton observed this on his farm. In fact, he was forever digging out drains. And he was a very pragmatic man and wondered what on earth was going on. This soil kept on appearing in his drain all the time, but he still had plenty of soil. And he realised that soil had to reform and there was a process of renewal all the time. But that had to happen over long periods of time. And in fact, his observations about soil erosion on his own farm and the varied rock formations of Scotland led to his, possibly his greatest theory, what's the theory of the earth, which really changed our, our, the way we look at the world forever. And there's this fantastic quote about no vestige of a beginning, no prospect of an end in relation to the deep time that we know the world has, has been around for. So really fundamentally changed uh, the way we think about the world and a very strong link to, to soils. This is how we measure soil erosion today. Uh, this is near our, one of our farms at Balrudry, and we can actually quantify the amount of soil that we're eroding. And we know that, that we're actually losing a diffuse amount of soil all the time from our fields. And that rate of erosion is exceeding the rate of soil formation. So we do have a problem. And there's downstream problems with that erosion into our water courses. But you can actually fix some of these problems very easily. And here's two photographs. One is a potato field. So on the left hand side you can see the potatoes growing on the, um, the ridges and in the furrows hopefully you can see some ponds of water and those ponds of water have been caused because they've used something called a tide ridger and it leaves a little dam of soil at a regular spacing so the water stays in the field and that pr helps to prevent the, the erosion. And the image on the right is a, a, ridge, a tide ridge and furrow method that's been, then been planted with grasses and flower species. And the, the furrows and the ridges have been put perpendicular to the flow of the water. So the water can't flow through the field and you don't get the soil erosion. You capture all the soil at the edge of the field. So a very simple, pragmatic way of actually stopping erosion from our fields. And in fact, this was a methodology that was invented by our farm staff. And the chap in the, in the middle there is Ewan Caldwell. You might recognise some of the others. Uh, receiving the Nature of Scotland award for what was called the magic margins uh, which is a way of actually preventing soil erosion from agricultural fields and it was developed by the farm staff at the institute uh, a very innovative way of actually dealing with a very practical problem and the picture above shows you what the margin looks like when all the wildflowers are growing and the other amazing thing about this was that in the region that we are we have criminal gangs who come out to the fields to horse to uh, do hair coursing and the way you uh, do hair coursing is you drive around the outside of the field, you drive all the hairs into the middle and you set the dogs on them. Now if you've got a ridge and furrow system around the edge of the field you can't drive on it. So we actually stopped the hair coursing on our farm uh, which was another added biodiversity benefit. We didn't think of that in advance I have to tell you. but um, 
So, uh, so the next part I want to talk about is the, the climate emergency because all of the problems we have are overshadowed by what's actually happening with the climate. And this graph shows the mitigation curves. And the blue lines sort of show what would we need to do if we'd started in the year 2000. We'd need a rate of about 2% per year mitigation. And the, the black line is the actual um, CO2 that's been emitted. The red lines show what we've got to do from now, from 2019. And really, you've got 10 years to really turn things around. And the world has never reduced emissions at the required rate for more than a year or two before. So this is a massive challenge, is how do we suddenly start reducing emissions at a rate we've never done it before? And it is a huge challenge. And it's prompted people to start thinking about completely new major scale type things we need to do, such as United Nations who have declared that the decade 2021 to 2030 will be the UN decade on ecosystem restoration. And that's partly because they've estimated that restoration could remove up to 26 gigatons of greenhouse gases from the atmosphere. If we do very large scale ecosystem restoration, there's a major carbon benefit. And also in the report, they claim that it offered unparalleled opportunity for job creation, food security and addressing climate change. How, how can that how can all these things all happen at the same time? How can we still produce food, restore our ecosystems and get all these benefits? It's very, very challenging. I'm going to draw uh, next to talk about the situation in Scotland and I'm going to draw from the Hutton Atlas one particular map I'm going to take out of the Atlas and talk about in the context of climate change. And the map is the land capability for agriculture. And I've got two versions of the same map and the green and the yellow areas on the left hand side are the prime agricultural land areas of Scotland where we can grow the, the widest range of crops in Scotland. The map on the right is the same land capability for agriculture but forecast till the year 2050 with the climate that we will have in the year 2050. And what you'll see is a lot more yellow and a bit more green. So in Scotland, because we're going to be warmer and wetter, we potentially will have more land that's capable of growing a wider range of crops. It sounds good, but it's not as simple as that. There's actually going to potentially increase risks around drought and flooding that we'll need to cope with. And expanding our agricultural cropping areas to some of this land would actually endanger soil carbon and endanger biodiversity. So just because we can doesn't mean to say we should. There are many, many challenges around this. It's very difficult to get totally controlled environments. Stacking the growing space requires a lot of energy and power. And those costs for power go even higher when you have to offset the lighting and the ventilation aspect. So it's getting lots of attention, uh, lots of investment. I mean, huge sums of investment by Amazon, Google, Ikea. They're all investing in it. But profitability actually remains rather elusive. <coughs> and our climate is getting more variable. If you, this is actual rainfall data I asked one of our climate scientists to calculate. Now, you need to look at the scale this is the total precipitation volume in Scotland. And you can see that the range is between 100 billion and 160 billion cubic metres of rain falls in Scotland every year. Now, you should never be depressed about that because today's rain is tomorrow's whiskey. Mm -hmm. and it's also tomorrow's soft fruit and potatoes and all the things we do usefully with water. And it's an abundant natural asset of Scotland. But what you see is the rainfall is going up over time. But also, the amplitude of the variation between years is going up. So we're seeing more drought years and more flood years. And that's what we're going to have to cope with in the future. So our land use system is going to have to be adaptive to be more resilient in the future. Now there's a double headed arrow on that slide, which actually is a scale of 40 billion cubic meters, which is a little bit more than all the water in all of our freshwater locks. So that's the variation you're experiencing. Imagine all the water in all of our locks just disappeared one from one year to the next. That's the variation in our rainfall. It is also coincidentally very close to the 40 billion cubic metres of water that we store in the top one metre of our soils. So soils are a really important reservoir between these different years. Now, two years ago, we had a drought in Scotland and it was slightly better than in England and Wales because we have, we have more rain and we have more organic matter in our soils. And if you have more organic matter in your soil, you store more water. And in fact, we did a calculation that if all of the agricultural soils in Scotland had been at their highest 
organic matter content, it would have been the equivalent of between three and six days of extra rainfall. Most farmers would have paid quite a lot of money to have three or six days of rainfall in a drought year. So these things are all linked together in terms of the carbon and the multiple benefits from changing the way we manage our soil. Now, uh, early this year, we were in the Institute reflecting on the mass engagement that was happening around the climate crisis. And uh, we really sort of had an internal reflective moment about, are we doing enough? And we used this graph from uh, Howden to look at all the things that we do in terms of looking at different crop varieties, planting times, spacing, uh, in terms of how we adapt to, to climate change. And a lot of our research is in that middle area around systems adaptation, uh, climate change ready crops. For example, we're doing research on our heat tolerant potato, which we'll need for a future climate, climate sensitive precision agriculture and diversification and risk management. Natural flood management comes into that category of a systems adaptation. But we're not, and we don't think many other people are actually doing a huge amount about the transformational adaptation that we actually need. We identified a couple of things. Vertical indoor farming, we think is transformative. And large scale habitat restoration of peatlands, woodlands, agroforestry. Changing our land use to farm for carbon or farm for water. These are transformational things and we need to do more of these in the future if we're really gonna tackle the climate change crisis. And also, nobody's gonna thank us 20 years from now if we turn around and say, we told you it was going badly. And the other conclusion we came to is we need to do more action-based research, where we actually take action and we do the research at the same time. That is what's got to happen to have the transformative change we actually are looking for. And one of the things we decided we'd, we would do is have a flagship in initiative around what we call a climate positive farm. And what we mean by that is it's, it's positive in terms of fixing carbon, but it's also adapted and ready for a, an uncertain future. Now the Hutton farms have long been at the forefront of innovation in land and agricultural practices. So we've made a decision now to actually transform one of our farms with types of land use decisions that we're all havering about and prevaricating about. And we're going to do this as an experiment. So Glen Sox is going to try and grow its natural capital and be climate positive. We're proposing to double the area of woodland from 7 to 14 percent. Now the average on most Scottish farms is about 8%, so we want to double that, but also use agroforestry, where we have livestock grazing between space trees, and you can see some of those in the photographs, and use the on-farm renewables in the water on the farm to generate electricity, heat, and importantly hydrogen fuel for the farm tractors, and possibly for the local rural economy. And livestock numbers will inevitably have to be reduced as part of a high nature value farming system, using things like tall grass grazing, also known as mob grazing, and making sure that the livestock are fed as much as possible on grass, but that grass is high in clover so that you can reduce the fertiliser inputs. So how do you take all of the agroecological principles you know can change things, how do you take all the technology you know can change things and do them on one farm and track and experiment in an objective evidence gathering way as to what the effects and the benefits and the disbenefits actually are. So that's um, just news of that experiment that's starting. But for some people, they think that vertical farming is the future. And this is Google's Director of Engineering, Ray Kurzweil, who, who, who feels this is the way forward. And you can see a sort of image of a tall factory building, uh, which the people envisage will be the way in which we should be really growing food. And it's using all the technologies available to us to grow food indoors in uh, completely artificial conditions. Doesn't sound particularly appealing, I have to say, uh, in terms of how you grow food. And if you look on the internet, you'll see that there are many, many challenges around this. It's very difficult to get totally controlled environments. Stacking the growing space requires a lot of energy and power. And those costs for power go even higher when you have to offset the lighting and the ventilation aspect. So it's getting lots of attention, uh, lots of investment. I mean, huge sums of investment by Amazon, Google, Ikea. They're all investing in it. But profitability actually remains rather elusive. <coughs> Maybe. And this is a, a picture inside this indoor vertical farm. It's Scotland's first vertical mm -hmm. farm, but it's probably the UK's most advanced. It's all about converging different types of technology, tunable precision LED lights, which only deliver the light wavelengths that the plants actually use. It uses artificial intelligence to learn how to do that best with a com combination of sensors for the plant growth. 
and it uses smart energy management systems which can flex with the national grid so they're only using energy when it's in uh, low demand by other people and that cuts the costs of the energy hugely. It also uses robotics and of course the James Hutton Institute we provide the plant breeding science and the knowledge around uh, growing crops. Now I'm going to try and show uh, a video of this. I'm With those combination of technologies, the cost of producing food in indoor vertical farms is coming down hugely. And as the cost comes down, you can grow a much wider range of foods and all sorts of kind of crops and foods become viable to grow in this indoor vertical farming system. And it's not just about growing that food indoors. These indoor vertical farming systems are actually fantastic for conventional agriculture and for horticulture and for forestry and for restoration. Because it's all about growing plants as fast and as fit and as healthy as you possibly can. And it means that we can grow them 365 days a year, we can do what we call speed breeding. At the moment, to develop a new variety of barley, it can take 10 to 15 years. Mm. And we grow one population every, every year until we get to the best new population. If you can grow four <coughs> populations in a year, we can probably half the time to get to a new barley variety for agriculture. So this speed breeding is gonna be revolutionary in terms of conventional agriculture. But it's also very good for mass propagating the crops that you want to plant out, mass propagating trees. One of the big problems of the climate change crisis at the moment is that everybody knows they need to plant trees. There's not enough trees to, pass, to plant. We're not producing enough trees in, in tree nurseries. And that could be true of the major scale restoration that we have to do. So these systems could be very useful for propagating in a mass uh, way the, the plants that we need for doing restoration projects. And again, you can grow to demand in planting season, which saves time and money. And we could also potentially rediscover heritage varieties. Many of the varieties that we used to like have gone by the board simply because they're not able to deal with modern pests and diseases or modern weather. In an indoor vertical farm, you're independent of the weather. You're independent of those pests and disease. So you could actually start growing these heritage varieties once again. And also the technology that's inside of these systems could be retrofitted into glass houses and polytunnels. And we've envisaged that you could maybe even have mobile in-field lighting condition going on for crops. You can actually use light to switch on plant immune responses. So if you thought there was a disease threat coming in the next couple of weeks, you could literally go around the field with the right wavelength and switch the plant on in terms of its immune response. It sounds fantastical, but actually it's possible. So huge range of alternative ways of actually growing crops in the future. And the thing about the vertical farming is that it really does align with Scotland's needs, its natural assets and the early advantages we have. Uh, our needs are to be more climate and land independent. We need fresh and nutritious, healthier, safer food, especially in remote rural areas. For 365 days a year with zero air miles would do a huge amount for our carbon footprint. But we also need to be less reliant on labour in a dwindling and ageing population. And that's particularly true of the rural and the remote rural areas. And clearly we need to reduce our environmental footprint of food production in all these ways. But our natural assets and our high quality abundant water and abundant renewable energy, the two natural assets that you still need for indoor vertical farms. And I think we do also have an advantage with the innovation leaders in the food and drink in the farming systems and in the plant and the growing sciences. So I think there's a tremendous opportunity for Scotland in, in this particular area. But fairness and equity in the food system isn't a global issue, it's also a local issue and you'll be very familiar with the fact of uh, food banks increasing in numbers around the country. Uh, this slide just simply shows how the Trussell Trust 
uh, have got, had a 13% increase on the amount of emergency food packages they've had to um, provide. And what we really need are new food secure communities which are give people dignity in the way in which they actually get their food. Um, and, and that's, a, you know, handing it out in the way we are currently handing out doesn't provide people with the dignity that they should really deserve. And that raises all sorts of questions about things like indoor vertical farming. Who's going to own the indoor vertical farming in the future? Is it going to be the likes of Amazon, Ikea and Tesco? Or is it going to be communities who are close to the point of use? The indoor vertical farms are very scalable. They could be on massive factory scale or they could be on small local scale. So, for example, I'm going to Orkney Islands uh, next month to talk to how Orkney might have an indoor vertical farm because they've got 120% renewable energy. And the 20% surplus energy they've got is going to waste. It's not being used for anything. So it could be used for growing food on Orkney um, and make uh, fresh produce much more available to the communities in Orkney. This doesn't have to be about big business as long as we socialise and democratise the technology. And I think that's a very key, key point. Now I'm getting close to the end and I wanted to just float potentially a big idea about indoor vertical farming. Because you can grow food all year round, uh, for some crops you can get 10 harvests in a year. Um, and because of the greater yield and the reduced cost, you can actually have an equivalency of 100 times that of agricultural land. So there's about 40,000 hectares of derelict land in the UK, mostly urban and close to disadvantaged communities. And we grow 53% of our fruit and veg using about 118,000 hectares of very high quality land in most cases. And the 47% of our fruit and veg we import costs about a billion uh, pounds. So what if we could flip all the dead land to grow food? Because an indoor vertical farm is independent of weather and independent of land. And we use protected cropping in indoor vertical farms. We could substitute probably all of our imports and even spare land for nature and release that intensively managed land that we're currently using for other things. So I genuinely think thinking about indoor vertical farming in the right way could be truly transformative. So I'd like to uh, thank um, the, the colleagues at the James Hutton Institute, the Scottish Enterprise and Scottish Government for funding and to um, finish by saying that the reason I'm saying that soil might be too, too valuable for growing food is that we are dependent on it for all these other things, the carbon sequestration, the flood control, the biodiversity. These might be more valuable in growing food and we ha potentially have other alternatives to grow our food without soil. So I'd like to conclude on that and just say if you are interested in hearing more about the James Hutton and our work, we do have a free online e-magazine called Hutton Highlights, which you can sign up to on our web pages and keep a track of all the things we do.